Good morning. Um, greetings from Georgia, University of Georgia, the College of uh, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. My name is Ray Hicks. I'm a county extension agent there in, in southeast Georgia. Uh, to give you a little background, uh, Scriven County, which is the county I work in, is one of 159 counties in Georgia, and we do have an extension office in all counties there in the state, which I feel like is, is very fortunate for our producers of the state. Now, Scriven County is located about 100 miles northwest of Savannah, so I'm right on the South Carolina border. And the soil types that we have there, excuse me, in Scriven County ranges anywhere from sugar sand that you'd have on the beach to a good loamy soil to red clay, so we have a little bit of all of it. Forgive me, I'm, I'm trying to, to battle a cold. Um, to a, a little bit about, uh, you know, I have one or two organic producers there in the county. Uh, for us, we was talking here earlier, uh, for, for me, three to five acres is a, is a large organic farm in my area. Uh, I do cover a, a number of multiple counties around in the southeast to help him with organic. Uh, nothing compared to what y'all have out here in, in, in the west. Uh, I say we're a fledgling of organic community. We're, we're growing. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, homeowners to adopt, adapt to the principles of organic. They're not going through the certification process, but they want to follow the same principles of that. Um, a number of years ago, back about 2002, I had a, a lady walk into my office one day and sit down and she said that she was uh, coming back to the family farm. She was an engineer by trade. Her father was getting up in age and was going to retire and she wanted to come back to the farm. And she wanted to do organic farming. And, and, and I asked her, I said, ma'am, I said, I know nothing about organic. I'm a, I'm a conventional farmer uh, extension agent. Uh, you know, we've got uh, corn, cotton, peanuts, soybeans, uh, cattle, dairy, uh, you name it. We've got it there in Scriven County. But at that time, we did not have one organic farmer in, in the community. But I said, we'll sit down and then we'll learn. We'll, we'll go together. So that's what she was looking for. So we started researching projects, and, and she started going through the certification process. And to begin with, she was doing one or two acres going through being certified as organic. And today, she has 50 acres uh, certified, and, and she's not utilizing all 50 acres, but she is keeping the certification up. And she's primarily growing vegetables. Uh, she has uh, been able to uh, reap the benefits of some NRCS grants. Uh, she's put in a, a solid state uh, irrigation system and been able to put up a hoop house too on there. But uh, through the years, in about 2007, 2008, she had been buying cover crops, of course, to, to go there on her farm. And uh, for us, all the cover crops has to come from the Midwest or the West. And it gets expensive trying to, to buy those seed. There, is nothing, there was nothing locally grown that we could come into. So we started uh, kicking the idea around, and, and one of my counterparts up at the university said, well, why don't we do a, a research project and see if it could be economically feasible to, to grow cover crop seed here in the Southeast? So we uh, drew up a grant and through the National Organic uh, Research Foundation was awarded that grant for 2009 and 2010. And this is going to be kind of an overview of that project of uh, organic cover crop seed and whether it's sustainable. Uh, of course, um, one of the, the things we, we wanted to look at, of course, as we said, there's very little seed production in the true south. Um, many of the seed that you think about growing, you have to be a mindful of their, their protected seed, in other words, they're patented. Uh, so you have to make sure to get a public variety, especially if you're going to sell that variety. Uh, you also have to make sure that you have the equipment and uh, line up a seed cleaner that's going to be able to, to process those seed with you. We had a, a number of, of seed cleaners in our area, but they all done conventional seed. And as you well know, it takes a lot of time and effort to clean out and be certified to, to go through the organic. And then having the bins to be able to dry those seed and, and store those seeds. So that's one of the infrastructure that you need to look at. Uh, the two cover crops that we wanted to look at was rye and clover. Uh, you know, for us, that's what we primarily use. Uh, clover is excellent as far as being a, a nitrogen fixation to, to go back in, into the ground. Uh, rye, again, it is used a great deal there in the south uh, by conventional farmers as well as, as excuse me organic farmers um, rye produces a lot of biomass uh, it produces has a allelopathic 
uh, gene in it or, or chemical in it that uh, if you use it as a cover crop and mulch it down will help reduce the weed pressure that you have. Uh, builds up uh, organic matter, which is something for us in Georgia, we have very little organic matter, very little topsoil. Um, and, and again, uh, it will grow well in our climate. Uh, we wanted to look at, again, whether the seed sales could be another source of income for her, for her enterprise. Renza Bruiser rye is what we used in Dixie, Clo uh, Dixie Crimson what was the clover. Uh, some of the objectives that we wanted to look at was, was the yields that we're going to be able to obtain, uh, whether the seed quality was going to be good, again, profitability, and as I said before, any special equipment and then it adaptations that we needed to do to, to go into this enterprise. The, the research plot was three third acre replicated three times. Uh, as we said with the clover we used Dixie Crimson and the rye was Renza Bruza. Uh, the rye plots received three tons of chicken litter, poultry litter, pre-plant incorporated in the fall. Cover, the clover cover crop uh, did not receive any uh, added nutrients to it. Here in the, in the south we planted in mid-October as you can see, we harvested the clover in mid-May. We harvested the rye the 1st of June. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll go over some of the, the observations as we went through the two-year trial of things that we would, could do different that I think would help improve it. This is just a picture of a, a grain drill. Uh, we was, as we said, NRCS is very helpful in our area. They have this grain drill that's available to rent to the producers at a very uh, minor uh, rate. Uh, it has a small seed attachment where you can uh, put the clover out as well as a large seed attachment that you can put the, the rye out with. Very important to go into a clean, stale seed bed to keep that weed pressure down. Uh, make sure that you have good seed to soil contact. Uh, as, we, as you can see in this picture, uh, the cooperator and myself are, are riding that drill and we're getting out periodically to look and make sure that we're getting good seed placement on there. Uh, now, if you not have a, a, a large drill available. They are small wildlife plot drills available, especially for us in the south, that you might be able to, to borry uh, again and clean out to where it's good for the organic seed. But there's a lot of different ad adaptations that you can use. And even an old drill that's been out in the barn for a long time, if you can get it calibrated right to get the seeding rate down right, will work. This is just a picture of the rye uh, as, as it's standing. Uh, I don't know if you can see it too well, but we did have some weed pressure in, in the rye. Uh, of course, we are the godfather of a Palmer Amaranth uh, resistant weed. Uh, that was one of the problems and uh, another weed that is very prevalent in the area, especially in our small grains in the wintertime, is wild mustard. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to, to row get out. So weed pressure is one of the things that, uh, that, that hampered us somewhat uh, and we, we did not get a good good handle on it. Uh, this is a picture of the clover uh, with the cooperator standing out in it. Uh, we had a tremendous stand of clover. The bees loved it. Uh, she brought, uh, she had two or three uh, uh, beekeepers that wanted to bring uh, hives in to, to harvest off, off the clover crop. But again, uh, trying to get that clover to dry down in a timely manner and be able to get a combine in it uh, is a major problem for us in the south. When we got ready to harvest, uh, the university provided us with a, a small plot combine to begin with. Uh, again, for most producers, this is not going to be a, a available on there. But uh, again, it, it worked real well getting us some, some good data as far as yield on there. What we did wind up doing, the, the producer found a 1948 Alice Chalmers all crop combine. Tongue pulled, PTO driven. Uh, it's not going to be the fastest thing in the world, but I think she paid like $1,200 for this, and, and she's able to harvest numerous things with it. We, we've harvested not only the, the rye and the clover, uh, she's grown some buckwheat, we've harvested it. Uh, she's grown soybeans, we've harvested it. Um, anything that you can get to, 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 to go up the, the shoot of it, basically you can harvest. Uh, again, you're not wanting to go out in hundreds of acres to do it, but on a small farm plot, it works real well. Just some more pictures of the combine as we're going through. We, we basically had to have a man standing on the platform and there on the combine to make sure that uh, on the rye, especially that it was feeding up the, 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 the curtain well and, and going through the combine. Uh, Again, we, we could harvest, we could probably travel 
two, two and a half miles an hour in a crop. So, I mean, you, you can cover some ground, but again, it's not got like a, a five foot swath to it. So you're not going to cover a lot of ground over a, a short period of time. Just a picture of some of the uh, clover seed that we had combine go, go through on there. As you can see, it's got a lot of chaff in it, so that's the reason you need to take it to the cleaner and, and get it cleaned. Uh, again, you need to be mindful of the moisture content that's in it to make sure to keep it dry or you'll be able to force some air through it to get it dry. Or you can spread it out on some tarps or anything and, and get it in the sun sound, depending on the amount of quantity that you've got out in it. Uh, again, just another shot of the rye. This is it uh, in the, the grain bins, that the, one of the grain bins that we had, and we could have that forced air coming up underneath it to, to dry it out. Picture of the, the rye seed as well. Now, some of the results that we had over the two-year period, we averaged 197 pounds to the acre of clover seed. Realizing that that doesn't stand up to anything of what y'all can do out here in the West, but for us, that, that's, that's pretty good yield on there. Uh, rye was 17 bushels to the acre. Uh, some of the observations that we, we found that we needed to find, again, some sort of desiccant that we could come in on that clover seed and spray on it to help it dry down more uniformly when it got ready. Because so many times we had green seed in, in with dry seed, and, and that just makes a headache trying to handle that. Uh, we needed to increase our seeding rate. Uh, as we said, we, we basically done uh, 20 pounds to the acre on uh, clover and uh, two bushel on rye. Some research that's been done out of North Carolina State uh, says that if you can increase that by half to, to a double rate, it will help you as far as uh, keeping those weed suppressions down. So we, we want, I wanted to try the next time we do this uh, to, to increase the, the, the seeding rate and to try to checkerboard it to, to get a more uniform uh, a coverage on there. Uh, as we said, with the, the rye, we put uh, two tons of chicken litter down in the, in the fall. As you know, chicken litter, chicken litter is very slow release, so that pretty well covered us through the wintertime. But on, on our sandy soils, that leached out. We needed to come back in, in the spring and, and add an additional source of nitrogen in some way, which we did not. Uh, and I think that would be helpful on it too. And again, especially with the rye harvesting it on time, uh, clover as well. If you get a, if it gets mature, you get a heavy wind, a hard packing rain. That stuff's going to bed down on you, and you're, it's going to be hard for any combine to, to pick it up. Uh, economical analysis, as you can see. Uh, oh, this is for the uh, rye cover crop. Uh, we average, as we said, 17 bushels to the acres, what we averaged on there. If you figure a, a selling cost of $42, uh, that's a receipts per acre of 709. You can see down at the bottom that our total cost of production, uh, excluding land, was 548 on there. Now, granted, as we said, this was 09 and 010, so our fuel prices are a little bit different. Uh, lime uh, is basically about the same price as it is there. Uh, chicken litter is running about the same price as in there. But you can change these numbers. Uh, we've got these budgets online, and you can change these numbers and play with them and kind of see how it works out on, on your farm. The main thing is looking at the net returns above total cost up there at the top. You can see our 17 uh, bushel yield uh, at $36 a bushel. We still reap $60 an acre profit on there. Uh, if you can increase your yield or increase your cost that you're going to sell that uh, organic rye for, uh, of course, we'll, we'll increase it well. And, and Matt and Dave may have some different numbers from, from, from this, but I looked online this morning and organic rye seed is selling for $69 a bag uh, from this one establishment. Again, that price may vary what whatever. Uh, this past year, a uh, cost of, of uh, conventional rye in my area was $23 a bag. Uh, seed supply was, was very short on there. So as you can see, the, the, the rye production can be profitable uh, if, if you play your numbers right. Looking at the clover seed, uh, again, 197 pounds was our yield. We priced it at, at $2 a pound if you're going to sell it. Uh, Realizing $394 an acre, as you can see, our, our total cost down at the bottom, excluding land, was 
dollars an acre. Again, fuel prices and, and, and all could change just a little bit. Looking at your net returns, uh, 197 of pound yield up there at a dollar and a half a pound if you sell it, you're still going to realize $51 a pound or $51 an acre profit. Uh, again, I went online, uh, organic uh, clover seed uh, was selling for $7 a pound online with it. So uh, in summary, uh, you know, cover crop seed production in a specialized niche market can be profitable. Uh, if you develop that market, you need to have some place to sell it. Uh, you don't just need to grow it. Uh, as they say, if you build it, they may, may not come. You need to make sure to develop your market out there uh, with it. But especially if you're going to do it on your own farm for your own uh, production, uh, it can save you some money. Uh, again, uh, it's not for everyone, but, but it works real well on, on different uh, situations. I want to thank our, my farm cooperator there in the area, Relinda Walker. Uh, Julia Gaskin, which is a sustainable agriculture coordinator there at the university. Amanda, Amanda Smith is our uh, economics uh, uh, guru that run all the numbers for me. Uh, Jeff Wilson was a USDA ARS research plant pathologist. Harry Schromberg with USDA ARS ecologist. And also the, the Organic Farming Research Foundation for providing the grant to, to, for us to, to do this and, and see how it worked out. I realize I've crammed a lot down your throat uh, in a very short time, but I'll be happy to answer any questions now, or we can have questions later on, however you want to do it. The, the question of what was the Alice Chalmers comment, it's called an all crop. Um, you can find them online. Uh, Yaz, if you go to the internet, uh, Yaz is a, is a good place for parts and everything. But in the meantime, you just scour the countryside. A lot of these are parked under the barns that nobody's using anymore. That, that'll still work. Uh, is, is there an issue finding parts for like a, the, the all crop? Uh, so far, we have not had an issue on there. Uh, Yaz has been a very, our only source of going to find parts. But we've also found out that uh, mainly a, a belt or a bearing is the only thing that you're going to need to find. So much of the other stuff is, is wooden, and, and you can make it in the farm shop. Uh, on there, uh, we've had to replace the uh, the, the the screens, uh, the the frame for the screens. One time, we just built them in the shop there on the farm. Yes, yes, it, it has good cleanouts on it. The the secret to the, these older machines is to to keep them lubricated well, and also to take all the tension off of the the springs and the belts and and the and the skirts and everything because they will stretch, and, and especially with an all crop on that. Um, rubber chute going up to the throat, it, it'll start slipping and, and you'll start building up there. Yes, the, the, the whole presentation is in the proceedings on there. And again, my contact uh, information is, is in there. Be happy to, to talk with you uh, either now or you know give me a call later on down the road. Uh, I pretty well tell all my producers I have my cell phone on my belt all the time. Uh, I will answer it on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, the only time that I, I usually cut it off is if I go on vacation. I'm going to take a day or two off. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.